Let's dive right into this trendy topic. Not a day goes by that we don't hear something about GLP-1. Sure. But for our listeners, what the heck is it and why is everybody talking about it? Yeah, so GLP-1 is a short form for glucagon-like peptide. This is a incretin based hormone you know so in our body to to regulate the glucose responses about the pancreas has two kind of cells the beta cells that make insulin and the alpha cells that make glucagon and they kind of you know keep each other in check uh insulin spikes up to regulate glucose levels and and just so you don't go into hypoglycemia glucagon is made to sort of keep the insulin levels in check as well and so glucagon like peptide one is is a peptide and it's it's a incredible as i mentioned hormone that basically keeps also the glucagon levels in check. In obesity, GLP-1 levels are known to go down and regulates gastric emptying, also hits the sort of the what we call the gut-brain axis, so keeps not only the hunger away and the satiety in control, but connects to the brain's reward center. And so it's like a two-pronged approach to hit the uh, diabetes and obesity. So that's why they, you know, it was initially discovered as an anti-diabetic medication and all the trials were done in that field. And, and over time, they've just sort of repurposed it to see its big effects in obesity. Since this is a, this is a natural hormone, yeah. what are we doing wrong that uh, our modern diets have disrupted this this natural communication system and this natural control system? Well, we are doing a lot wrong, uh, starting with eating a lot of processed fast food. And I mean, our gut microbiome, there's a big connection, as I mentioned, to the gut-brain axis, eating a lot of fat-enriched diet. The, the wrong fat kind of, you know, also induces a lot of inflammation in the body. So it's essentially, you know, hitting on this gut microbiome dysbiosis. And if you were eating a lot of fiber and you had a lot of acromansia or the good bacteria that are also stimulants of GLP-1 production in your body, then you wouldn't really have a problem, right? And if you exercise itself is known to stimulate GLP-1, uh, certain fasting regimens also. So if you ate the right calories in, in moderation and, you know, did your exercise and ate your fiber and probiotics and then, you know, postbiotics, which we'll get into it, you would really not have an issue. But we are all kind of you know, fast-tracked our life into ease reward system. So we eat fast food and whatever we get our hands on, stress, all that upsets our gut microbiome and upsets GLP-1 physiology. Let's fast forward to uh, GLP-1 uh, targeting drugs. Hopefully, I mean, you can't go on the internet without or seeing a TV commercial without seeing these. And our audience probably has two or three friends or they themselves might be on these drugs. So how do these drugs work? Are they just supercharged GLP-1 or talk us through the mechanism? Yeah, so these are agonists. So these these are what we call GLP-1 agonists, which means they will really boost uh, the action of the GLP-1 incretin hormone and that will regulate satiety, that will regulate glucose levels. And a lot of early clinical trial data showed that you know, compared to the, let's say, the first and second generation medications to counter diabetes, for example, they had a had a much safer profile because they weren't really inducing hypoglycemia, et cetera, things like this. So that's how they were developed. And then they started finding, you know, because it hits this gut brain axis as we were at the reward center, people started studying it further. It really delays gastric emptying, lowers appetite, and people started to lose weight in these trials. And then they ran bigger trials and saw that in 12 months to 15 months, people would lose 15% of their body weight. You know? So that's how all the craze has started. And I still say it as a clinician, we're developed for a certain class of patients and people with healthy body weight should not be taking it. But that's where, you know, the things have moved. I tell my patients that um, to date, there has never been a safe weight loss drug long term. Mm -hmm. Everyone uh, has has failed for various reasons, uh, da often dangerous reasons. But one of the things that I think uh, I'm concerned about and a lot of patients are concerned about mm -hmm. is some of these trials show a, a fairly dramatic loss of muscle as True. part of the weight loss. Can you talk about uh, some of those trials? Because I think that needs to be talked about a lot more, and that's one of the reasons I wanted you on the program. 
you nailed it. Not all weight loss is healthy, right? So what was seen in these trials um, done, I think the first ones uh, really came out about three years back in, in the New England Journal of Medicine. These are called the step uh, one studies and the sustained studies. And what they saw in these cohort of about 2,000 patients as they looked at their body composition over time, you know, longitudinally, was they were, you know, these are very good drugs for the target they're known to, and they result in 15% weight loss. But out of that 15%, 10% is fat loss and 5% is muscle mass loss. Now, if you quantify that in terms of kilograms, just to give you an idea, that's you're losing about 10 to 15 pounds of muscle compared to 20 pounds of fat in about a year to year and a half time frame. Now, if you look at the trajectory of muscle loss during aging, for example, you lose 1% every year. And over 10 years of your aging process, you lose 10%. So you're kind of turbocharging that sort of not only the fat loss, but the muscle loss that will accompany. And if you're young, overweight, this may be okay. You may be able to recover. But if you're older, 50, 60, 70 year old, you're really at risk of inducing what we call is in the clinical field is sarcopenia and frailty. A couple things about that. One of the things that uh, I tell my patients is that muscles are really the customer that insulin sells uh, sugar to. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if you're a salesperson, you would like to have a very large customer base to buy your product. Mm -hmm. And in fact, my patients don't realize that their weight loss with this muscle mass means that, okay, great, you've lost some weight, but if you ever go off these drugs, Sorry. you all of a sudden have a whole lot less customers to sell what you're eating to. Uh, is yeah. that a good way, number one, to describe it? Yeah, I, I couldn't have said it better. I think that's what you're hitting on is these are expensive drugs. They cost about 1000 1500 a month. So you're looking at spending about twelve to 20 k a year to keep your lose weight. And then once you lose weight, people say, oh, okay, I'm going to get out of this because I've already achieved my target. The important thing is in these studies that have followed up, they've seen that if you get wean off these drugs, the fat comes back very fast, right? Yeah. And it comes back, but the muscle will never come back. And so you're going to have a bigger problem at hand of what I call sarcopenic obesity, because you're going to just take the good muscle away and you're going to you know, replace it with more fat uh, that will come on once you wean off. So I think there needs to be an education, both from the healthcare practitioners. And I mean, these companies, the pharmaceutical companies know the side effects, right? They are already looking for the next generation of uh, these medicines that have a muscle sparing effect. It kind of reminds me like the statins that people knew had mitochondrial toxicity to a certain, and then, you know, of course. So that's where we are in the field. Today. Yeah. So let's go back to sarcopenia. Uh, yeah. You're right. I think many people, uh, particularly overweight people, will say, my thigh is, I wear the same size pants that I wore when I was 30. I still got great muscle in there. But if, uh, if we ever do like MRIs or even CT scans of these people and compare the same circumference leg to, of a, say, a 60-year-old to a 30-year-old, lo and mm -hmm. behold, the leg size may be the same size, but now the muscle mass is, is dramatically reduced mm -hmm. and it's been replaced by fat. Mm -hmm. And I think the other thing that people unfortunately don't understand is that this fat can weave itself uh, between muscle cells and muscle fibers, and you have a well-marbled piece of beef and it's this marbling that actually makes, among other things, muscles more, more insulin resistant and harder to deliver the glucose into them. So it's, it's like a one-two punch that you really don't want to have happen. So now I have heard and I've seen that there are actually companies saying, well, that's easy to fix. All you got to do is eat more protein. And the more protein you eat, the more muscle you'll build. And I've 
I see it on the internet every day. Talk us through, uh, really? All I have to do to make muscle is eat protein? No. So, you know, <laughs> I've been in the running clinical trials, randomized trials in the nutrition field for a good 20 years now. And a lot of them initially were high protein supplementation in older adults. They don't work. They don't show anything unless you add exercise on top. You have to give the body some stimulus to synthesize the protein. And that's why I don't get the high protein fad so much because they say, oh, take 10 grams. And then you have another company selling 20 grams. Then somebody sells you 40 grams of protein. It's not the amount. It's A, the quality of the protein. And B, at a certain age, you hit what is called as anabolic resistance to really absorbing you know, the protein. And your body, which is really the mitochondria, are the sites of protein synthesis. So unless you have your mitochondria in shape, unless they are muscle quality is better, the high protein is not going to do anything. So I think what the recommendation with these, at least these GLP-1 drugs, should be under supervised clinical care, should they be given to the target population. And during sort of the weaning, there should be a very good dietary counsel, very good physical activity counseling to these folks, you know, how to keep the fat away and keep the muscle preserved. I think it's a very powerful word, muscle preservation. And I just want to reiterate that somehow it makes great marketing sense uh, to say, well, okay, we know that you're going to lose muscle on these drugs. Uh, let's admit it. All the clinical trials show that that happens. Uh, and since, um, Muscles are made of protein. All you got to do is eat more protein. <laughs> I'm a fan of Christopher Gardner, who's head of nutrition at Stanford. He makes some very logical points. Number one, most of the protein we eat is, is not turned into muscle fiber and is not yeah. used in repair and bone. Uh, most of the protein we eat, and we can argue you know, it's around maybe 20% of the protein we eat is actually utilized with a nitrogen molecule on it, but the rest is stripped off into primarily glucose. And that glucose can either be used by the mitochondria directly, or if the mitochondria don't need any more, uh, it's shifted into fat. And that's the sad thing about this, that even eating all this protein will just make more fat. And it's... Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, don't shoot the messengers. That's just the basic physiology. Yeah. So how do we get the mitochondria, uh, which is uh, your interest and my interest, how do we get them more interested in um, manufacturing protein? Yeah, I, I think it's really improving the quality of the muscle and the quality of your mitochondria. And there are certain ways to improve uh, mitochondrial health. We know that. And you can improve the efficiency of the mitochondria. So you can take the pool of healthy mitochondria you have and basically get them to produce more ATP, which is the currency of energy. There's ways to create newer healthy mitochondria. It's another uh, biological way to improve mitochondrial health that we call mitochondrial biogenesis. And they are compounds, the NAD boosters, uh, good old resveratrol, all these hit this pathway. And then the, the molecule, the postbiotic uh, molecule we've been studying, it's a totally new, well-conserved pathway called mitophagy. And that's basically taking out the damaged uh, mitochondria out from the cellular system, which in overweight obesity, I can tell you, we've looked at the muscle in the mitochondria. There's a lot of these faulty mitochondria. So it basically takes the, the bad mitochondria out and replaces them with newer healthy ones and and that sort of gives you new batteries to turbocharge your mitochondria which end up processing protein and better protein synthesis one of the things i've been impressed with uh, through the years now with timeline nutrition is that you guys uh, do these clinical trials this is not conjecture on your part uh, and this is you know this is not dreaming on your part are there promising studies about this topic that, that you can share with us yeah sure i mean yeah as you said i mean we've been at it for 17 years now if, if i count the the years uh, 17 years of research and and the word research is, is a fascinating actually my md and phd advisor told me it's actually two words re and search you have to keep going back Anurag. That's what you know he used to say, and I have his voice always in my head. It's never one trial, never two trials. You have to, you know, look in different populations. So we looked in older adults that were very sedentary, uh, overweight, probably a good population to take these GLP one like drugs. And we looked at their mitochondria and they were in such bad shape. And we then 
did randomized clinical trials in, in these very sedentary, overweight, older adults where we gave them different increasing doses of, of furolitin A, or which is also called mitopure versus placebo. And we saw we could actually reverse the mitochondria into looking like what a fit 60, 70 year olds uh, mitochondria who had been training all their life for half marathons would look like. And building on there, we went to even younger 50 year olds who were overweight obese. And we saw that giving without changing physical activity or diet uh, drastically in those populations for two to four months, we saw improved in PQO2. So improving sort of the mitochondrial consumption of how mitochondria utilize energy and better strength and endurance. So that, that's the studies we have run and just finished the study even in athletes where you would think in athletes uh, going to Olympics, uh, they'll probably have best mitochondria. Overtraining in these athletes induces mitochondrial dysfunction and inflammation. And we see even there we can have big effects in recovery. I want to hear that again because we are always looking for exercise in a bottle, but your studies have actually shown that you can take non-exercising individuals and actually improve their, their muscle quality. Am yeah. I saying that correctly? Yeah, I, I think we're hitting the same biology as, as regular exercise or caloric restriction of about 15% reducing your calories would hit, which is basically the mitochondria. You know, the mitochondria gets stressed if you eat too much, if there's too much sort of nutrient utilization, they, they get burnt out, as I call them. And so this is what this molecule is, what we are seeing is doing, is hitting the same biology. Yeah, I wrote a, a whole book about it called The Energy Paradox, and you're right. The, it's literally, there's rush hour, I use LA terms, there's rush hour almost 24 hours in our mitochondria and uh -huh. be because of our <laughs> constant overeating. And you're right, these guys burn out, and fuel production uh, yeah. literally you know, falls in a tank. So you've got to rev these guys up. And, and again, I think you're, you're seeing with your lithin A, might appear, these same effects that intermittent fasting does, that exercise does. Uh -huh. And, you know, and I think I've, I've shared with you, or I've shared at least on on my podcast, um, or before I started your lithin A, I'll, I'll, I'll turn 74 in a couple months. And my wife and I are actually avid hikers. And we think nothing of hiking 8 to 12 miles every day in hills in Italy or France or outside our home. Uh -huh. And yet I noticed, oh, in my late 60s, early 70s, that if nothing else, my balance wasn't as good on, on these rocky terrains. And I wasn't as interested, I might say. And my wife at one point said, well, you know, look at all these old people. They're using poles. They're using hiking sticks. Maybe it's time to get yourself a pair of hiking sticks. And I'm going, yeah, yeah maybe I should. Well, I actually happened upon urolithin A through Mitopure and started taking it. And one of the things that actually changed within months was my balance dramatically improved. And uh -huh. now to think that I need uh, hiking sticks is kind of laughable. In fact, there's a straight up uh, trail in the south of France outside of Nice, which is called Nietzsche's Trail, and it's uh -huh. in Ez. And it's, it's literally straight up. It's supposed to take you an hour. We've had friends that we've taken along and we have a really good friend who says, oh, I can make it under an hour. And we go, boy, that's really, that's really moving. And two months ago, uh, we did it in, in 50 minutes, which was actually our record. And wow. And so the only thing really that's changed, my training hasn't changed. I'm older, but my, my muscles clearly got younger. And unfortunately, I blame it on uh, Mitopure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, thanks for sharing. That's a great story. I don't endorse things that I don't, number one, personally try, and number two, that I haven't read the, you know, the literature and the studies. Mm -hmm. So you guys are really to be congratulated on, on developing this. Um, 
What else is in the pipeline? Yeah, so 17 years in, we think we're just getting started. The thing is, when you publish really top line and do the hard yards, people like you and other top scientists are really recognizing those efforts, and they're starting to look into it. At least three groups have started looking at uh, the effect on cognition and how this helps in things like uh, delaying uh, the progression of cognitive decline that happens with aging. And they've all come up, you know, they've all like screened hundreds and thousands of natural compounds, drugs that can delay dementia, all these dementia, Parkinson's disease, the root cause is mitochondrial dysfunction. Absolutely. And so that's uh, where we're getting a lot of interest and we are embarking on a study to see how we can improve brain metabolism and that how that can result in better cognitive ability. We are just wrapping big study on immune aging because that's one area where people have not really appreciated the role of mitochondria. As you go older, your T cells, the sort of the guardians that keep the flu, the COVID and the cancers away, they, they go away. You know, they, these sort of youthful T cells go away. And so we have been studying how rewiring the mitochondria of these immune T cells can sort of bring them to a more youthful state. So that's something that you will hear soon. Very exciting stuff. And then we're looking at skin aging as well through topical ways of delivering MitoPure to see, you know, can we do like a 360 approach to longevity? I've got to say that my wife loves your uh, topical urolithin A. Um, so I think you're on to something as well. Uh, yeah. Is urolithin A, is MitoPure one of the pieces to to, sure. you know, to keep these drugs from damaging what you don't want to damage? No, absolutely. I think it's something I believe very strongly that, you know, this sort of uh, muscle preservation aspect, uh, sort of the muscle sparing effect. And so that there needs to be a thought process on what is this ozempic support protocol, right? And that should be, you know, as I mentioned, uh, having a nutritionist or a dietitian give sort of good dietary counseling to these uh, folks who have been taking Ozempic for a certain period of time. There needs to be a physical activity guidance through personal trainers, et cetera. But there is a very big space for nutrition companion products. And I know you mentioned it, a lot of high protein selling companies have, are positioning themselves as that companion product. And I think boosting muscle mass is not the solution at all. And we've all gone down that road. And I think really focusing on your muscle quality by improved mitochondrial health and energetics is sort of the nutrition companion approach. And we actually, I forgot to mention, we're running a study now with actually the lady at National Institute for Aging who discovered GLP-1, where she wants to go into pre-diabetics and see how MitoPure is actually regulating glucose metabolism and GLP-1 production. So we think this is a very good, you know, sort of support protocol. Great. Well, yeah, I think that's well overdue. And, you know, again, for anybody listening and you're on these drugs or considering these drugs, you absolutely have to do everything you can to support your muscle wasting. Because uh, if you don't, it's going to happen and you will be sorry for the effects. I see it in my clinics. And of course, there are there are Ozempic faces, and uh, some of my plastic surgeon colleagues just think that Ozempic is the best thing that ever happened to them. Uh, <laughs> but we won't go there. So I understand that you've got a, uh, a discount uh, for mm -hmm. those who want to try MitoPure. Sure, yeah. I think uh, folks listening on uh, to the podcast and will listen to, to this, I think it's going to return and they'll get a 10% discount on the products. Timeline.com slash Gundry. And uh, yeah, 10% off your first purchase. That's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't endorse anything that I haven't tried, haven't read the literature. And my personal experience has been nothing but uh, superb with this. And I, you know, I congratulate you for doing all this and keep up the good work. Thanks for watching, but don't go anywhere. The next episode of the Dr. Gundry podcast is waiting for you now. And the way the stomach determines whether all the protein has been digested is the acid in your stomach is used up in digesting the protein.